The title of this uh, Irish music and the Irish language is I try to figure out what does this actually mean, what are we talking about here? Um, and you get down to some definitions. What is Irish music? And we obviously, there's probably no problem with, you know, um, some of the old traditional fiddlers that we, we have been caught, caught in some of the catalogues. But um, what about Bono? Does he fit into the category of Irish music? He's Irish, he plays music here. So. Uh, Basically what I'm going to try and look at is just toy with that question, see what some people have said about the issue of what is Irish music, what's the connection, does Irish music have to be in Gaelic? Um, what about the whole tradition of, the, of English songs in, in Irish? What about Daniel O'Donnell? Do we put him down as, a, as an Irish, or is his music Irish? So there's a whole debate that's been going on for years about that. They also want to look at the importance of language and culture in terms of creation of identity um, and the effects of that and what's, what's happened over over years with regard to this. So, as I say, where does one start? You could come at it from many angles. The ethnomusico ethnomusicologist John Blacking defined music as socially organised sound. That's pretty wide. <laughs> Um, it's probably too wide of a definition for, for the purpose of this, this discussion, it seems reasonable that we should restrict the discussion to Irish music, but how do we define Irish music? Are we talking about traditional Irish music, are we talking about dance, songs, or are we talking about more modern stuff? If we're discussing the connection between the Irish language, it seems logical that we should discuss songs in Irish, but do we exclude songs in English? Professor Catherine O'Doherty says that from the early 1800s, Less than a third of the population of Ireland were monoglot Irish speakers. So it could be argued that to overly restrict or exclude songs written in English from the discussion, that it would be overly um, restrictive to exclude songs written in English from the discussion. These questions have vexed many who have broached the subject. Henry O'Marcy, writing in his introduction to Kate the Cool to Olu in 1915, was fairly restrictive in his definition of what constituted Irish music. He wrote, Collections of songs and poems by living Irish writers cannot be regarded as Irish poetry in their ideas, their metres, their petty end rhymes, and above all, in the complete absence of internal resonance, that most essential characteristic of modern Irish verse, they are as English as Moore's melodies, and are merely Irish by accident of the words being in Irish. Their writers, good Irish men, sorry about the women, good Irish men and ardent lovers of the Irish language are not withal steeped in the wealth of Irish poetic literature of the last 300 years. And their productions are not a new and natural leafing and branching of that once luxurious tree, but are rather roots, shoots of English origin grafted onto it, and never destined to bear flowers or fruit. So, Amelie was pretty clear in what his idea of the whole thing was. Um, he continued, for the last half a century, the young generation of Irish speakers, remember this is written at the start of the 20th century, for the last half a century, the young generation of Irish speakers are little more than semi-Irish in mind and spirit. They have ceased to memorise and sing or rehearse Irish poetry as their forefathers did, so that when the last of the old Shanachies and singers die out, they will be succeeded by a race no longer steeped in that poetry and song. That was his view. Brendan Bratnock, in his book, F uh, Folk Music and Dances of Ireland, published in 1971, had a slightly different snap on the whole thing. He wrote, If one were to make a collection of the songs of the Irish people, one could hardly hesitate about including The Last Rose of Summer and Silent O' Moyle from Moore's Melodies, patriotic songs like My Dark Rosaline, The Memory of the Dead and Bowl of Oak, and some of the songs of Percy French. But, he goes on, if the collection were to be restricted to folk song, all of these would be discarded. Folk song, he says, have been described as the songs of the people. Folk music and song are the product of the folk and accordingly anonymous. A heritage which is passed on from one age to the next, hence the term traditional, which is usually applied to it in Ireland, it includes not only the older songs and melodies of the Gael, which is undoubtedly our most precious heritage, but also the Anglo-Irish and English ballads of the countryside 
and the extraordinary rich vein of dance music which belongs exclusively neither to Gael Tocht nor Gael Tocht. So obviously Brendan Bratnack had a, had a wider view as to what constitutes Irish music. Um, more recent, uh, Dr. Uh, Garage O'Halloran wrote, uh, he's again has a much less restrictive view of the whole thing. He says, there's no ironclad definition of Irish traditional music. According to him, it involves different types of singing, dancing and instrumental music developed by Irish people at home and abroad. Over the course of several centuries, Irish traditional music is eventually essentially oral in character and is transmitted from one generation to the next through a process of performance. <coughs> Anyone who's familiar with the traditional music scene in Belfast, which I've been told by people from outside, outside Belfast is the best city in Ireland for traditional music at the moment. Therefore, it's probably the best traditional city in the world for traditional music, which is nice to think. Um, but you can see when you go into some of these bars and you see traditional music sitting there of, of all the whole generations and older people and young people just coming in straight from the McPeak School of Music or from the Anderson Town School of Music and starting their t first timid uh, strides into actually playing in a session. You can see that process of the music being handed on from generation to generation right before your eyes. It's quite amazing actually and something sometimes we don't, we don't appreciate. Okay, more recently Dr. Regent Reg Hall writing on the introduction to Topic Musics or Topic Records, The Voice of the People series which has been re-released recently and revised in 2012. He's a different approach. He writes, any attempt to describe, let alone define, traditional music and dance is inevitably loaded with paradoxes and contradictions. To start with it, <clears throat> there is no popular or even academic consensus about what they include or exclude. Having long coexisted and crossbred with popular culture, the boundaries between the tradition and popular cultures are blurred, and it can be argued there is value in keeping them blurred. He goes on to say, <clears throat> Uh, there has been a shift from the elitist patronising notion that folk song is the corporate and primitive creation of an anonymous, amorphous population of folk who are the bearers of the tradition. It can now be recognised that traditional music and dance are created and developed by real identifiable people within real identifiable communities. So there's an entire range of views as to what actually constitutes Irish music and Irish traditional music. And it, gets, and it gets wider. The debate as to where or what or where the origins of Irish traditional music uh, has gone even wider. Bob Quinn, who produced a, tr a trilogy of films called The Atlantean in the, in the 80s and a book as well, uh, took connections that he observed between Shamno singing in Ireland and singing in North Africa as a basis for a cross-cultural comparison between lands connected by the Atlantic seaways. He argues that Connemara Shano singing represents a an ancient musical form which has its equivalence in other peripheral areas around the world and whose apparent connection is the sea, the rivers and the general maritime perspective. This is the, 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 book, the famous Bob Quinn trilogy. trilogy. Sean O'Reilly also claimed that the Connemara form of Shano singing had resonances with forms outside the narrow confines of Europe. Um, Lilith O'Leary, who's probably known to quite a lot of us here, disagrees strongly with this analysis. He writes, he writes, One aspect that disturbs me, however, is the insistent exoticization claimed for traditional Gaelic song, likening it to flamenco, North American, Asian or Indian singing. Such a strategy is meant to be sympathetic, but it deliberately removes this kind of singing from the real and places it in the in one hermetic, ahistorical, timeless category, rendering it mysterious, Eastern and non-European. He continues, such claims are highly exaggerated. Affinity's approach between various kinds of non-Western singing and Irish traditional singing, while they may exist, are no proof of a common origin. But this suggestion continues to be advanced as if it somehow bestows some ineffable quality of superiority on the tradition. Writers in Shano singing have evoked Eastern models in, its, in an attempt to show the contrast between mainstream European singing and the Gaelic style. This is still there, uh, Lewis. 
Such ideas gained particular momentum at the turn of the 20th century at the Gaelic League's Oireachtas, Oireachtas. Pre-conquest Gaelic culture was invoked as a golden age, and Shano singing was understandably deemed to represent the survival from that area. Hence it was invested with much of the baggage of separatist cultural nationalism, leading to an inordinate emphasis on the ways in which it differed from European singing, considered to represent the colonial elite. And let us continue. Uh, he developed the point on cultural nationalism in an article he wrote with Anthony McCann, where they argue that the binary opposition between Irish and English languages was established in the discourse of Irish cultural nationalism. They continue, proponents of this two traditions hypothesis construct an image of Gaelic song, this Gaelic song tradition that is absolutely different and separate from English language, its English language counterpoint part. The Gaelic song tradition is constructed primarily as not English, not English language. So already as we just skim the surface of the question of, our, of music, we can see that there are a number of diverse positions and opinions. Can Irish music only be created by unnamed anonymous individuals steeped in the, in, and apprenticed in the Gaelic tradition for years before the music can be accepted, accepted as genuinely part of the tradition? Or given that the country was predominantly bilingual by the 1800s, is it not reasonable to accept that genuine Irish music can be created within the context of a predominantly bilingual English-speaking population? The discourse, has the discourse around the connection of Irish music with the Irish language indeed become part of the discourses of Irish cultural nationalism and become invested with much of the baggage of separatist cultural nationalism? And does it matter if it has? So this question is one that has not, is not only confined to Ireland. The connection of music, language and culture has long been recognised as being important in creating a people's sense of identity. Language and culture can be used to change a people's sense of who they are and their sense of their place in the world. In the period of direct colonial expansion, on a worldwide basis, the colonial powers certainly understood the importance of language and culture in moulding the sense of identity and in forming a worldview of the people they sought to colonise. The existence of the English-speaking world, the Spanish-speaking world, the French-speaking world, um, are clear examples of how important and how, how the, the colonial powers recognised the importance of bringing the language or of, of forcing their language on the countries that they were trying to, to colonise. The linguist, the linguist Benjamin Lee Worf argued that language actually shapes the worldview of a people. A change in language can transform our appreciation of the cosmos, he says. Many other writers and intellectuals in countries which have been subjected to colonization have recognized the importance of language and culture in contrib contrib contributing to a people's sense of identity in the process of colonization. The Kenyan writer, uh, Nuigi Wa Thongo, I hope I've said that almost right, <coughs> wrote, values are the basis of people's identity, their sense of particularity as members of the human race. All this is carried by language, language as culture, is the collective memory bank of a people's experience. Culture is almost indistinguishable from the language. <clears throat> he further states, the bullet was the means of physical subjugation, the language was the means of spiritual subjugation. Albert Mani, the Tunisian writer, <clears throat> wrote, the colonized mother tongue is precisely the one that is least valued. And uh, Paulo Freire from Brazil made a similar point for cultural invasion to succeed, it is essential that those invaded become convinced of their intrinsic inferiority. Franz Fanon wrote, Colonialism turns the past of the oppressed people and distorts the figures and destroys it. And more closer to home, <coughs> Thomas McShemine writes, The colonization process entails a progression from the condition of free culturally independent agents to that of super-colonized subjects reduced to economic and cultural dependence on their colonial masters. So, does the history of musical, linguistic and cultural development in Ireland show this experience of culture, cultural colonization and subjection and subjugation and have attempts to preserve and promote the Irish language and culture become part of the agenda 
of separatist, separate cultural nationalism. A quick look over the history, and probably um, this is where the granny suck an egg territory, where I'm sure you've heard about this before. A quick look over the history will give some indication <coughs> there were certainly legislative attempts to restrict the Irish language, music, and other aspects of the native culture. Um, cultural changes accompanied the Norman Conquest uh, in the 12th century. In 1366, the Statutes of Kilkenny, which were written in French, prescribed the use of the Irish language. It became an offence for Norman settlers to entertain native bards, pipers and harpers. The Gaelic Irish living in Norman communities were required to speak English, but famously, according to all our school books, within a generation, the Normans had become more Irish than the Irish themselves. One of the things I remember from primary school, uh, learning the Irish language and promoting and patronising musicians. Henry, the, Henry VIII, the first English king to declare himself King of Ireland, called for a tax on the Ar Irish music and poetry, calling for harpers and organs, by, think, by which I think he meant pipers, to be destroyed, or pipes, to be destroyed, and pipers and bards to be suppressed. Elizabeth I continued with this campaign, calling for bards and harpers to be executed. The quote often attributed to her is, to hang the harpers wherever found and destroy their instruments. Ironically, Elizabeth I is reported to have, been, have encouraged the use of Irish with a view to promoting the Reformed religion and also to have expressed a desire to, to understand Irish. There's an, an Irish primer was prepared for her. Um, I, some of you may have seen that. There's a copy of that. or a, The actual primer or a copy of it is in Farmley House in Dublin. Uh, so if you ever want to find out how much Irish Elizabeth I knew, go down and have a look at that. You used to say it's, it's uh, not Ulster Irish. <laughs> uh, in 1596, Edmund Spencer, the poet and English coloniser in England during Elizabeth's reign, wrote a pamphlet entitled A View of the Present State of Ireland. The pamphlet argued that Ireland would never be totally pacified until its indigenous language and customs had been destroyed, if necessary, by violence. He wrote, The words are the image of the mind. The speech being Irish, the heart must needs be Irish. So what was this culture that the colonizers were so concerned about? The earliest written form, again, a lot of you will know this, or maybe even, maybe even know more of it, or different. The earliest written form of the Irish language is inscribed on stones in the Ogham's uh, alphabet during the 3rd or 4th century. The earliest written form, uh, Old Irish, appears in the margins of Latin manuscripts as early as the 6th century. And... Uh, and the Irish writing dates back to the sorry, and the manuscript Irish in, writing in Irish language dates back to the fifth century, with manuscripts dating from the eighth century still serving as among the oldest vernacular literature in Western Europe. The first book in Irish was printed in the 1560s, John Knox's Common uh, Book of Common Order, and was published in Edinburgh in English and Scots Gaelic. The first book in Irish to be printed in Ireland was a Protestant catechism written by John Kearney in 1571. The earliest written references to musicians in Ireland was in the Brehan Laws at the end of the 8th century, which refers to the legal standing of the harpers, who, although considered inferior to poets, were considered to have a higher status than all other musicians. Pipers were referred to in the 11th poem, In a Harmon, in the Book of Leinster. And there's a lot of other rep there's representations of a triangular harp in the 9th century Psalter of Folkhard, and harps and pipes and mirrors have featured in high crosses from the 9th century. So it's obvious that the tradition of the traditional instruments that we still recognize as traditional instruments have been around for a long time. A gentleman called Geraldus Camprenis from Wales, who visited Ireland in 1183, and he became a royal clerk in the chaplain and chaplain to King Henry II of England, referred to Irish people as barbarians. Nevertheless, he added, I find among these people commendable diligence only on musical instruments, on which they are incomparably more skilled than any other nation I have seen. Their style is quick and lively. It is remarkable that with such rapid finger work, the musical rhythm is maintained, and that by unflailing disciplined art, the integrity of the time is preserved throughout the ornate rhymes and profusely intricate polyphony. Not bad for a school of barbarians, I suppose. Historical events in Ireland affected the developments of the culture and language and the music. 
Many of these historical events, events then were actually recorded um, by the people present at the time in, in terms of songs and music. Again, uh, Dr. Dr. Gary O'Harlan uh, uh, writes, in the period 1200 to 1600, Bardic pit patronage extended throughout the Gaelic world, where hundreds of noble families kept hereditary phila or bards who were schooled for years, sometimes up to 14 years, in the history, genealogy, geography, and culture. This leads to an intense period of poetic activity where the professional bards, mastering the rigid arrangement of syllables in a line or stanza, were the cultural guard guardians of a Celtic of a Gaelic order, eulogizing their patrons, the eulogies being sung by a, by a, a rachara, accompanied by a court kirchera or harpist. During the 17th century, after the Battle of Conceal, after the Battle of Conceal and the Flight of the Earls, the old Gaelic order disappeared, and the role of the Philip and the Rakara and the Kritcher was undermined. The hereditary Philip <coughs> were replaced by itinerant bards who composed, recited, and provided their own musical accompaniment. With the plantation of Ulster, the start of the 17th century, it introduced still more cultural changes, with people coming from Gaelic-speaking areas of Scotland, Presbyterians from Galloway and Argyll brought jigs and dance tunes, which, some of which were quite similar to what was here, but some of which weren't. The arrival of Cromwell and the Cromwellian, Cromwellian Wars in the, the mid-17th century, as well as visiting, visiting much suffering on the Irish people, inevitably had an effect on the culture and language of the music. About 50,000 people were deported uh, as indentured labourers during the period, often sent to English colonies in North America and Caribbean. In Barbados, one of the descendants we... <coughs> They're still known as Red Legs over there. Uh, many speakers and numbers of musicians were among those deported. There's a report in the minute book of the Council of the Barbados on January 1656 of an Irish piper, Cornelius O'Brien, having been sentenced to have 21 lashes on his bare back for inciting mutiny and disturbing the peace. Typical piper, one might add. <laughs> um, joke again. <laughs> many others ha had to leave Ireland <coughs> after fighting Cromwell, including, including uh, John O'Dwyer of Tipperary, who's now uh, commemorated in Sean, John o Sean O'Dwyer of Glenna. I read just part of how the historical events were affecting the culture and the culture and the songs, and then were recording it themselves. Uh, in the, later in the 17th century, when James II arrived, he was reportedly welcomed uh, with bagpipes and dancers. And among the tune that he particularly enjoyed was Lily Bolero, which is slightly ironic because now that tune is uh, celebrated by a lot of the people who were following uh, the king who opposed him, King William, uh, as is now known or played as the Protestant Boys, quite often heard in the streets of Belfast. Um, king William himself arrived at Carrick Fergus in uh, 1690 and headed through Belfast, entering the North Gate. I've just been actually doing some work on his, his progress. I decided to come down, uh, down North Street and seemed to come in Carrick, down along Carrick Hill from Carrick Fergus down North Street and then he arrived up in the, the old church, St George's Church, but that's to digress. Um, a number of, uh, William arrived after the boy, James's generals withdrew west of the Shannon and uh, with Athlone and Limerick being on their, their strongholds. A number of pieces of music from this period, uh, the Limerick Lament commemorates the flight of the wild geese after the second siege of Limerick. And there's a number of other pieces, contempor contemporaries or written some, you know, a short time afterwards. Um, Ockram's, Ockram's dread, dread disaster and Colin the Man Sonar, the, the crying of the women after the slaughter. The laments or kinu were probably, are probably the oldest form of song that have survived in Ireland. After the Williamite victory, <coughs> anti-Catholic penal laws placed restrictions on Catholics, including the Catholic clergy. Again, these actions led to songs. Anrotu and Garrick, um, and Kinu and Sagar, Trigus Phil, Phil Finneru and Og, was based on a priest who converted to the established church, then followed Dominic O'Donnell in Donegal. I presume there's a lot of you who have known that anyway. On a more positive note, love songs composed by anon anonymous poets tend to dominate folk songs in the late 17th century. The love affair between uh, Carvel O'Dally and Eleanor Kavanagh has been associated with the 16th century song Eileen Maroon and, the, and of course Donal Oak comes from that period as well. I had intended, but this went on for too long, to actually have samples of some of these songs here for you, but 
Maybe sure we're going to have a bit of a sing song at the end. Um, we can pick a sensory each. <laughs> The last remnants of the Bardic Order survived as itinerant harpers and th whose patrons were now new ascendancy landlords and some old Gaelic families. The music of the harpers had acquired features of continental and English composers, while some maintained the old Irish style of playing with wire strings and crooked long fingernails. The music of Turlock O'Carlow is a mixture of Irish and non-Irish tunes from Barak to dance music. And technological advances, we tend to think of technology being a new thing, but technological advances also affected the culture and the music at the time. For example, the invention of the pianoforte, is that how you say that? In 1709, led to a decrease in the traditional harpers as it became more common in the, in the parlors of uh, the, the patrons of the harpers. By the 1720s, the Gaelic poets were reduced in status and lacking patronage. One of the last poets to have patronage was uh, Egan O'Rahilly, who became a proponent of the Ashleen Vision Song in that period, which became popular. Art McCoy, also well known to a lot of us, or his awful well known, he's, he's well known to us, and composed one of the most celebrated songs, Urkilic Regan. So a number of attempts were made to conserve the old Gaelic bardic, bardic traditions around this time. In 1730, a convention was held in Brewery in County Limerick, in 1780 a harp festival was held in Granary, uh, County Longford, and in 1792 of course the famous harp, uh, harp festival here in Belfast. This convention was held in the assembly buildings at the bottom of Donegal Street and North Street there, and still standing, and was the basis of Edward Bunting's collection of Irish music, and ironically um, the Bunting collection which is seen as you know, a fairly important uh, development or a point in, in conserving the Irish music was then all of it was taken uh, by Thomas Moore and he converted those songs in the music into those songs which are now sort of well were, were castigated at the start by some of the, the speakers that we quoted. Um, okay. Where are we down here? Oh yes the 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 Belfast Harpers Festival. It was held in this the 11th to the 13th of July, 1792, it just struck me that it would be difficult enough to organise a Harper's Convention in uh, the Assembly buildings on the 11th to the 13th of July these days, but that's <laughs> another, another question. Um, by, the time the, the, by the time of the convection, of this convention, the connection with the old style of Gaelic Harpers had been all but lost. Ten Harpers attended the convention, including one woman. Uh, and, only the old, and only one of them used the old style of the metal strings. The oldest harper was Dennis, Dennis Hampson. And he, his contribution, or among the, the songs that he contributes, contributed, was the Kula and Kula, which is how that comes down to us. Earlier attempts have been made to try to preserve aspects of the traditional music. The first exclusive collection of Irish music was Neil's, a collection of most celebrated Irish tunes published in Dublin in 1726, with tunes by O'Carlin and some others. The 1790s saw international events such as the revolution in France and America and the Enlightenment and Romantic movement across Europe having effects on the culture in Ireland. A sort of Celtic revival sought to explore the authentic Irish past and living conditions of Irish peasantry. But despite attempts to create a revival in the fortunes of the language and the old music towards the end of the, end of the 18th century, Professor Cahir Doherty writes of a catastrophic decline in the use of the Irish language in the early 1800s. This was even before the, the devastating effect of the, of the famine. There was, he says, a collapse of the socio-cultural matrix which supported the native society. He estimated that by the end of the 18th century there were 2.4 monoglot Irish speakers in Ireland, 2.4 million monoglot Irish speakers in Ireland, and that 13 years later, uh, this had declined to 2 million, so that's almost 20% loss in the space of just over a decade. Um, by the first quarter of the 19th century, O'Doherty reckons that Irish had become a minority language in a bilingual state with a majority of English speakers, and that the majority of Irish speakers had become bilingual. That may be a controversial view. He adds in the 18th century, <coughs> the 18th century brought an attack on the remainder of the native middle classes with the implementation of the, the penal laws which he claims helped maintain a downward pressure on the social status of Irish speakers. 
He suggests that this led to the majority of Irish people asserting their shared identity, not through the Irish language, but through other markers of identity, including what he refers to as the, lingu the linguistically neutral domain of Irish music. As the use of Irish language declined as the spoken language in the population, so, did, so too did the use of Irish in the songs. Again, Gary Joharan says, and believes that the transition from Irish to English as a spoken language in the country was marked by the growth of bilingual Macronic songs. Padraig and Nihulahan observed that the language preserved the songs, and once the language went, within a space of 30 years, the next generation neither had language nor songs. It's Padraig's uh, view of it, or one of the, the things he has to say about it. As the use of the Irish language declined, as the spoken, sorry, the additional factor in the move away from songs in the Irish language was that English and Scottish songs had, had begun to be spread through the, the, uh, the use of ballad sheets, which became popular. And also the nationalist political movements of the period were using English as their primary language of public communication. Daniel O'Connell conducted his mass rallies in English and the Young Irelanders published a number of patriotic songs, or quite a lot of patriotic songs in the nation, uh, that the newspaper that they published, but for the, were for the most part in English. Indeed, a French traveller, Capo, Capo, Fildi, Fildi, Capo de Fildi, a French traveller in Ireland, in 1839 wrote, of the implicit indifference towards the Irish language, which he believed characterised much of the Irish nationalist movement. He said, that the harp had been replaced by the piano in the drawing rooms of the ascendancy and, at the, and in the thatched houses of the people by the Ilian pipes. <laughs> Ilian pipes. Um, it's, it's just, I thought that was strange as far as people tend to see the Ilian pipes as a very traditional instrument, whereas he's complaining that it, they had replaced the harp in some of it in the houses of poor people. Of course, for centuries, Irish people had been emigrating and travelling around the world, and I think the, you know, there's, a, an, there's an important influence in terms of the number of pe people who went and brought the music away with them, and then it came back in a whole lot of different forms. It was a famous uh, television series, Bring It All Back Home, which dealt with some of that. Of course, for centuries, Irish people had been emigrating and travelling around the world, bringing their music and language with them. Throughout the 18th century, around a quarter of a million Scots-Irish and Scots settled in areas such as the Appalachians of Virginia and Pennsylvania, and the music which they took with them developed into Appalachian music and dance, which uh, we can hear and enjoy today. In the early 1800s, <coughs> Scots and Irish who worked for the Hudson Bay Company had introduced fi fi fiddle music to some of the native peoples, uh, so that Irish music was been played by the Mi'kwaq the Mi'kmaq people in Nova Scotia, and the Saltu uh, people in Manitoba. Later, during the Klondike, Klondike Gold Rush of the 1890s, Irish fiddlers shared tunes with the native Alaskans. Early, even earlier than that, immigration had been affecting the, the had been integrating the culture, our culture, or the Irish culture, with other other places. In the mid 1700s, Irish-speaking migrants from Waterford, East Cork, and Tipperary had settled in Newfoundland, calling their new home Taluanesk. They helped to create a strong tradition of Irish music, song and dance in the area which still survives to today. Many Irish were deported to Australian Van Diemen's Land in the late 70s or 1700s after the, and after the rise in 1798. Um, and again, a lot of that has been mortalised in songs of the time. Again, the Connerys uh, commemorises or memorises three Connery brothers, Patrick James and John, who were deported from the Irish-speaking area of Slave Nagua after a trial in Waterford in 1835. From, and also, and as we're aware, for many years <coughs> there was travel between Scotland and the areas of Donegal, Leitrim, Fermanagh and Sligo for factory workers, fishery workers and also seasonal migrant titty hookers. Many of these people were Irish speakers and many played trad Irish traditional music, often forming what became known as Bothy Bands, named after the Bottom or Huts where the potato workers lived. Uh, Rosie Rooney Grania from Aaron Moore, who was then a young woman, travelled with the potato workers to Scotland and she recalled there were few squads that didn't have a fiddler with them. 
The devastation of the famine in the 1840s, both in terms of those who died from starvation and disease, and those who emigrated in the notorious coffin ships, uh, was felt particularly strongly in the poorer areas where the majority of people spoke Irish. 54% of famine immigrants to the United States of America and Canada were from Irish-speaking areas. In the decade after the famine, almost 30% of the population emigrated mostly to North America and Canada. Many, many Irish speakers and musicians were among them. In 1850, 26% of the population of New York and 25% of the population of Chicago were Irish-born. And in 1851, there were over 9,000 Irish people living in Quebec. Irish traditional music and dance music became part of the Irish Quebecois communities. Not all of the immigration was across the Atlantic. Uh, from 1845, this is during the famine years, 45 to 55, between 200 and 300,000 Irish settled in Britain, in places like Glasgow, Liverpool, London, working on building sites, building roads and railways and so on. In addition to the personal loss involved in the famine and immigration, there was a major neg negative effect on the music and language at home in Ireland. In the 1850s, the music collector George Petrie wrote, the land of song is no longer tuneful. That was his reading after the, after the famine. After the devastation of the famine years and sub subsequent evictions, political upheaval continued with Athenians and, and later the Land League, others trying to, and <coughs> others trying to achieve some level of rights. Uh, for the, the song, and, and again there are songs celebrating a lot of these activities. Um, most of the songs celebrating these activities, however, were in English, so we see a change from in the earlier period, the songs celebrating the political events or commemorating the political events tended to be in Irish, whereas now, as the uh, 19th century moves on, uh, the songs tended to be in English. Uh, most of the songs celebrating the activities of these organisations were in English. Parnell often had marching bands playing national airs at his demonstrations, as at Daniel O'Connell, and indeed Father Matthew, <coughs> Father Matthew during his temperance crusade used marching bands. By the end of the century, many parishes had their own fife and drum bands marching at hurling matches and uh, football matches, and this tradition is still seen today, not least by the Orange Marching Bands, fife and drum bands here in the north. So throughout the 50 years from the end of the famine to the start of the 20th century, um, that statistic always amazes I me. Mean, it's only 50 years from the, the, the famine, which we tend to think of quite a long time ago. You know, when, when, I suppose one of the advantages of getting a bit older is that you can assess time better. Like we can think back 50 years, and it's not that long ago, of the things that were happening here in Belfast, and yet it was only that time from the start of the century to the famine, and when you think of the changes that took place over that period of time, it is quite amazing. Anyway, that's just the sort of things that occasionally strike me, how time, when you look at time, it's, it, it's, uh, it's not as long as you think. Um, through the 50 years from the end of the famine to the start of the 20th century, attempts were made to stem the loss of and to revitalize traditional music and the language. In 1851, George Petrie, who I mentioned earlier, founded the Society for the Preservation and Publication of the Melodies of Ireland. And with the help of Eugene O'Curry, a native Irish speaker, Petrie transcribed hundreds of songs and dance tunes. The work was published in 1855 as Ancient Music of Ireland. And there's a number of other collections which were going on at the same time. James Goodman from, from Dingle, an Irish speaker and piper, who, who became a Protestant curate in County Cork and later professor of Irish at Trinity College. He compiled four volumes of traditional music between the years 1660 and 66. Um, Patrick Weston Joyce, famous collector, and began collecting in Munster in the 1850s and published his Instant Music of Irish in 1873. He also published Irish Music and Song in 1886. He published Old Irish Folk Music and Songs in 1909, so it's coming right into the 20th century. And in 1903, Francis and James O'Neill published Irish Music of Ireland, the largest collection of Irish dance tunes ever published, 1,850 pieces. Uh, and he subsequently published a number of other uh, books as well. In 1907, he published The Dance Music of Ireland with 101 tunes in it, which is still in use. So a lot of these, these productions are still used by people who are learning traditional music today. In 1910, he published Folk Music, a fascinating hobby, and in 1913, Irish Minstrels and Musicians. So towards the end of the 19th century and into the 20th century, organizations, organizations which aimed to protect and promote the Irish language, music and sport were set up. 
commonly class gale, the GAA, was founded in 1884 to promote the Gaelic games and established itself throughout the country, uh, setting up clubs in most areas by the turn of the century. Common the Gaelic League was founded in uh, 1893, Douglas de Hedia and Owen O'Neill, and established a network throughout the country to try and revive the Irish language. And they and brought in the Fesh Cure and the first Erectus back in 18. Uh, uh, 97, which was the date of the first Cayley as well in London. And of course there was a literary revival around W.B. Yeats and Lady, Lady Gregory and so on, who were again were trying to achieve a sense of a national identity at the time of the century, at, 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 that, at the end of the, the 19th century. The start of the 20th century saw turbulent years of agitation for, natural, for national, cultural, labour and women's rights, leading to the 1916 Rising, the War of Independence and the Civil War. Much of this was carried on against a background of World War I and was accompanied by a campaign in the north of the country against Home Rule. The result was partition with two states and two parliaments. You probably have never heard a summary of the 20th century in five lines <laughs> before. Um, <clears throat> with the creation of the new state in the south, some attempts were made to defend and promote the language and culture. In the 1937 Irish Constitution, at Bunrock uh, Ireland uh, Irish was seen, was given recognition as the official and uh, as the national and first official language of the country. English was also recognised as such. Uh, despite this, the government did not succeed in creating an Irish speaking or even a, a functional, a functioning bilingual state. Nor did it succeed in protecting and maintaining the number of Irish speakers in the Giltacht areas. Donacha O'Haley has described the Irish language policy followed by Irish governments as a complete and absolute disaster. Not pulling too many punches there. <laughs> it is an absolute indictment of successive Irish governments that at the foundation of the state there were 250,000 fluent Irish speakers living in Irish speaking or semi Irish speaking areas, but the number now is between 20 and 30,000. That was a quote from maybe 10 years ago, 2003. More than 10 years ago. Despite this, a number of advances have been made, notably the creation of Rally Miguel Takta, TG Cahar, which has enabled Irish speakers all over the country to hear the language spoken on a daily basis and provided a platform for traditional music, musicians and allowed them to be heard much wider than would otherwise have been the case. The Official Languages Act of 2003 has given the Irish language some level of legislative protection. In the North, uh, the new government set up after partition was hostile to the Irish language and made little or no effort to protect or promote it. Any advances made in terms of preserving the Irish language, music and other aspects of the culture were largely as a result of ordinary people working within the community. Uh, whenever I wrote that I said actually there were quite extraordinary people, quite a lot of them, but it was people working in the community. And with the signing of the Good Friday Agreement in, in 1998 the situation has improved particularly in the areas of Irish, Irish medium education, where there are currently some 5,000 students attending Irish medium schools, and around 30 Irish language primary schools and two Irish language secondary schools. Um, and legal protection for, in the form of an Irish language act, has still not been achieved in the north. Irish traditional music has seen a major resurgence since the second half of the 20th century, with the advent of recording. Um, <coughs> Uh, with the advent of recording, particularly in America, uh, sorry, I'll read that again. Uh, Irish traditional music has seen a major <coughs> resurgence since the second half of the 20th century. <coughs> with the advent of recording, particularly in America, and at the end of the 19th, at the end of the 19th century, numbers of Irish traditional music musicians who had emigrated to the U.S. began to be recorded and made available in 78 discs. Mick Maloney. Some of you may know him as been, he played with the Johnsons, an ethnomusicologist, and he's a folklorist and a musician, living in America now. He writes, Throughout the past four centuries, musicians from widely separated country, counties and villages in Ireland came together in America to create one of the richest cross-fertilizations of Irish folk, music styles and repertoires in the world. In the late 19th, in the late 19th and 20th centuries, Wonderful new approaches to Irish music were developed by generations of musicians in Boston, Chicago, Philadelphia and New York. These were amplified in the American recordings of great Irish born musicians and carried back to Ireland where they had a major influence on the evolution of uh, the music at home. In Ireland, wind-up recorders and radios became more available during the 1920s. 
1926, a radio station, 2RN, which eventually became RTE, uh, could be heard, in, but it only could be heard in Dublin, but its uh, director, Seamus Plandillion, uh, who was an Irish language and Irish music enthusiast, enthusiast encouraged traditional music, musicians to play live on this new radio station. A bit like Radio Fulcher. Um, the fo in, in 1935, <coughs> the Folklore Commission was set up to try to save Ireland's folklore and songs and, <coughs> and carried out much good work in this regard. And as I mean, there's all rings of Seamus Ennis and so on working with the folklore condition and a lot of other uh, people who went out around the country uh, transcribing songs and then later on recording them. Um, <coughs> however, advances in interest and support for the traditional music was not linear. In 1935, the Public Hall Dance Hall Act was introduced in an attempt to control public morality. It banned country house dances and all-night jazz dancing in unlicensed halls. And why wouldn't it? <laughs> um, it <coughs> Cross-country dances and the legal assemblies of dancers and musicians were also targeted with stories of house dancing being broken up by parish priests and the police. Uh, third musician Junior Graham complained about the passing of the Dance Hall Act. He said the clergy and the politicians abolished the country house dances. They believed there was immoral conduct carried out in the country houses and, the, and that there were no sanitary arrangements. That put an end to the country house. The country house was our school where we learned to play music and dance. And it was a crying shame that it was closed down against the country people. That's Junior Graham's. Okay, and also in terms of that middle period, you know, in the 30s, 40s, when uh, in, in the new Irish Free State, or the Irish Free State as it was. In early 1940, the new radio station, which I mentioned, 2RN, uh, it, it set up the Radio Erin Light Orchestra, and this was seen as an alternative to live Cayley bands on the radio. And from then on, any musician playing on the radio had to be auditioned and screened before they were allowed to perform on the radio. During the hungry 40s, Again, in, in the south, many people came from, the, from rural Ireland to Dublin. There were so many pipers and fiddlers, fiddlers in Dublin that the Dublin Pipers Club, which had been closed since 1926, was reopened by uh, Leo Rouson and some others. And Cayleys began to be held regularly in the, in the Mansion Club. 1951, the meeting in Mullingar decided to start the flak I have a flak in Mullingar during the wet weekend. It proved a great success and the flak movement has blossomed uh, since then, and made a major contribution to uh, the morale and the, and the standard of, of, uh, of uh, traditional musicians. And I couldn't talk about the, the music without mentioning our own McPig family, who have been traipsing through all of these years uh, here in Belfast and keeping the music alive, not only here in Belfast, but travelling throughout the world. The 1960s saw the coming of Sean O'Reardha, the blossoming of his, uh, his talent which helped transform traditional music. Um, in 1960 he wrote the score for the film Misha Era. Some of us maybe remember being taken out of school to go down and see it. Um, using traditional airs in an orchestral setting and he formed Kyotri Kulin and a whole series of other uh, endeavours that he, that he undertook. Helping present Irish music to a wide audience using new arrangements of traditional music. He produced a, seri uh, a radio series in 1962 and a book entitled Our Musical Heritage where he made those, the points of view that we, we talked about earlier on in terms of the Irish, Irish music having um, non-European uh, influences. He died in 1971, he was only 40 years of age. In 63, the Chieftains, strongly influenced by O'Reilly, released their first album. And 50 years later, it's clear that you know they have an audience on a worldwide basis and brought Irish music to thousands and millions of people and been followed by Clannad and often a whole squad. So we have come through, we're coming through a period whereby the Irish music scene is now recognised at a level that it had never been uh, ever before, probably. At the same time, the Irish language is seeing something of a revival in the urban areas, largely as a result of Irish med medium education. So that's a very quick skip through uh, some historical events, and I'm sure a lot of you could have uh, would have known most of that, or could maybe fill in a lot of the gaps. But let's go back very quickly to the questions which we which we asked at the start. Does the history of musical, linguistic, and cultural development in Ireland reflect an experience of cultural colonisation and subjugation? 
I think from the brief history that we uh, skipped through that we've had there, um, it should have shown that the Irish language and music and other aspects of culture have been ne negatively affected by direct and indirect colonisation and subjugation. Restrictive laws over the centuries have impinged negatively and in some instances still impinge negatively on Irish language, music and culture. In addition, the strength and proximity of the major globalised cultures have caused and continue to cause difficulty for minority languages, cultures and cultures to thrive or even survive. There's a consequent need for positive policies, attitudes and legislation to protect languages and cultures if large numbers of endangered languages and their associated cultures are to be prevented from being lost to future generations. At the current rate um, at which language lost is occurring in the world, it's estimated that 90% of the current languages existing in the world would be <coughs> extinct before the end of the century. So there is a need for protection and legislation for minority languages and cultures. What are the other questions? Have the attempts to preserve and promote the Irish language and culture become part of the agenda of separatist cultural nationalism? Or to ask the question in more familiar terms, I suppose, has the Irish language become politicised? I think that again, the brief skip through history uh, should show that, yes, indeed, the Irish language <coughs> has been politicised, has been a political issue. But I think it's reasonable to argue that it has been politicised by those who have in the past restricted and by those who are still attempting to restrict the language to prevent the growth and development of the Irish language and culture. If restrictions were removed from the Irish language and culture, if the language was allowed to develop on an equal basis of the English language here in Ireland, then opportunities for the language to be politicised would have been largely been removed. And the last point, the issue of cultural nationalism and of how a relationship between language and music and the culture contribute to the creation of a sense of identity, or in the words of Benjamin Worf, how a change in language can transform our appreciation of the cosmos, is not just an issue for histori historians, anthropologists and other learned academics. This is a discussion at the moment in some parts of uh, uh, this area. Um, for the desirability or otherwise of creating a common Northern Ireland identity for those living in this part of Ireland. In such a scenario, what would be the position of the Irish language, Irish music and culture in the future? In the age of social media, where ideas and images can be transmitted instantly and globally, is the role of language and music and culture still of central importance in creating a sense of identity? Do those who wish to control us still need to change our view of the cosmos? And if so, will they feel the need, in the words of our former colonizers, to destroy the indigenous language and customs, if necessary by violence, or to contemplate once again hanging the harpers? <laughs> okay.